up on Peninsula B, there's work to be done off the coast of Trump National. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month and Torrance Memorial will hold a health fair to educate the residents. There are hidden treasures on the peninsula and we will take you there. Local charity Freedom For You brings us some jazz music at Trump National. The Penn High football team gives back in their off season and a local author lives a fantasy in her work. Federal officials overseeing the Palos Verdes Reef Restoration Project met with local residents to present their latest plans. They're proposing to rebuild a reef offshore from Trump National Golf Club at Bunker Point. Nearly 15 years ago, the reef was buried after a landslide struck the golf course. The new reef will support ongoing efforts to restore marine habitat to the Palos Verdes Shelf. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, called NOAA, is heading up the environmental project. Liz Brown Swanson spoke with NOAA officials at the open house and joins us now. Liz. Hi, Maria. I'm here at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, where the community had a chance to come together to find out about the proposed Palos Verdes Reef Restoration Project. The focus of this project is to restore lost reef habitat. So a lot of the habitat off the Palos Verdes shelf has been buried due to the landslides that we are all familiar with. And we are designing a project to return that habitat to its most productive form. Marine scientists with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration presented their agency's proposal to build a $6 million reef offshore from Trump National at Bunker Point. The reef will replace the one buried by a landslide nearly 15 years ago at the former Ocean Trails Golf Course. The 18th hole of the golf course it was a pretty big source of the sediment that covered that reef habitat. There are other sources, the ongoing um, de deposition of, of dirt from the shoreline, but that one was a fairly large one that, um, that did appear to cover a large area of rocky reef habitat. It will take more than 70,000 tons of quarried rock from Santa Catalina Island to build the 40 plus acre reef on the ocean's sandy bottom, one third of a mile off RPV's coast. After years of researching the site, the actual construction should take 40 days. Once we start the project, we will um, work with the uh, quarry operators on Catalina Island. Um, we currently don't have a contractor on that uh, yet, but uh, with that contractor, once the rock is aggregated, it will be placed on barges, uh, towed across the channel, um, and set on a, on a large barge system with um, multiple anchors that can act like a dot matrix printer, for those that remember what that is. And what will happen is the, the barge will move in along parallel lines, releasing the rock according to our design. The best part about it is nobody, once the boats go away, nobody's going to know that it was done because it's all 40 to 60 feet underwater. There are going to be no buoys and uh, it's going to be totally invisible except for the extra kelp. So if you can uh, walk down the cliffs at Trump's, you'll have better scuba diving. The plan requires state and federal approvals and the city of RPV has an advisory role. Since the project is actually a third of a mile off the coast of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes near the Trump National Organization pro golf course uh, property, it's not in the boundary limits of the city. So the city is not the permitting agency involved in this. So we, we the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, only uh, plays a role as an advise in the advisory capacity. The restoration project is being funded and managed by the Montrose Settlements Restoration Program a Superfund program set up under NOAA in 2001. Montrose Settlements Restoration Program is a, a program that's uh, funded through a settlement with uh, the Montrose Company and several other defendants that released contaminants onto the Palos Verdes Shelf. Those contaminants have affected a number of resources, um, including uh, the, the fish habitat. Um, and so one of our uh, missions is to do projects that restore fish habitat and uh, we like to focus on the Palos Verdes Shelf because that's where the, the um, 
uh, the chemicals had their effect. Well, I'm the president of the American Cetacean Society, the world's oldest whale conservation organization, and so we had interest on how this might impact the whales and the gray whale migration as they migrate very close to shore, and we wanted to uh, find out if they were considering that migration during the construction of the process. Residents had questions about the reef's impact on marine life, surfing, and if the design might provide a solution to erosion problems up the coast at Portuguese Ben. One of the proposals that's been made to stabilize the landslide is to build a very similar structure off of the toe of the landslide to stop the waves from eroding the downstream end of the landslide and, um, and then possibly put some more rock revetment right at the toe of the landslide. So now we have right down the beach is this going in, so it's interesting to see what all is involved. There is a tie-in in the sense that um, this reef should tell us something about how the, the reef habitat affects the wave energy coming to the beach. And our goal is for the fish to benefit the fish populations and the fish habitat, the kelp, um, and just help restore you know, the healthy ecosystem that PV is known for. And so just, but hopefully bring you know, benefits to people that maybe scuba divers or snorkelers, um, fishers, and just the people that come out here and, and recreate out here and know about the restoration. We have to finalize our environmental document. Uh, we need to um, get approval from the, the State Lands Commission and we have to file for a, a federal consistency declaration from the Coastal Commission. Um, we're in the process of working with the Army Corps. There's an Army Corps permit um, that's involved and of course more very importantly we have to get a contract in place to, to build this thing. Public comments can be submitted through March 22nd at MSRP at NOAA.gov. If all goes as planned, the Bunker Point Reef will be approved by this summer and finished by the fall. I'm Liz Brown Swanson reporting for RPV TV. March is National Colon Cancer Awareness Month. In an effort to combat the deadly disease, Torrance Memorial Medical Center will distribute 200 free colorectal screening kits during a health fair on March the 15th. The Miracle of Living Fair is open to the public and takes place in the Richard Hoffman Conference Center from 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. During the special event, medical experts will discuss prevention efforts and the latest in colon cancer treatments. Participants can walk through a 10-foot tall inflatable colon exhibit to learn about the various stages of the disease. A study released by the American Cancer Society found that colon cancer is on the rise among young adults. Currently, colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths among men and women combined in the U.S. Studies also show that 60% of these deaths could be prevented with screening. For more information on the March 15th Health Fair, visit torrencememorial.org MOL. Peninsula residents got a sneak preview of some hidden treasures from the Palos Verdes Historical Society that were on display at the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center. Our event tonight was three different speakers working off of the uh, artifacts from the museum, from the potential museum, I should say. And I was lucky enough to get to talk about one of the secrets of the hill, which is uh, the underground in the 1920s. We had wooden water pipes, which is something I don't think many people knew. I didn't really. And it was really fun to have a section of this old pipe to bring out and show to everybody. It's, um, it's a little known part. We were always happy to and welcome new members. We had some new members join. We had some members that renewed their membership. We had people bring friends. And as you can hear behind me, there's still, the event's over and people are still here talking and having a good time. You know, I think it's extremely important that we have a historical society on the Palos Verdes Peninsula and that people are interested in doing research on the peninsula. We have a lot of research, who are, or a lot of people who are coming into the um, to the local history center who are doing research. But I think the broader, um, you know, peninsula and the broader community needs to be involved as well. So I'm really happy about that. And that was actually what inspired me to, to join tonight. You know, the library, um, since its conception, has actually been involved in the preserving the history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Peninsula, and it's actually written into the into the mission of the library to preserve the history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. 
really thought it was interesting today, uh, Vicki Mack talked about our redwood water pipes that we had in the ground until I think the late 60s. And it was really fascinating that they would actually use redwood pipes and they were not never supposed to disintegrate. I think the moisture deteriorated them probably and uh, they came loose because they were held together with joints and metal. And so they went to clay pipes, I think, and then metal pipes. But uh, I learned so much tonight, uh, and it was really a fascinating evening. Our end goal, of course, is to have a beautiful museum where we can show off all the thousands and thousands of artifacts that we have and build on it for the future so that the next generations can remember where they came from. You can look us up at uh, Palos Verdes Historical Society org and the website has the email address it has a membership form you can contact us that way and we'll just be happy to welcome you and when we come back there's music in the air at Trump National Golf Club and the Peninsula High football team gives back to help the homeless we'll be right back Get out your phone right now and save this number. It's the Lomita Sheriff Station. That's your local police. 310-539-1661. They want to help, and you know what? This is your chance to make sure you have their number. That's 310-539-1661. Your local sheriff station wants to keep you safe, and they want to hear from you. They want to know if there's a strange car in front of your house. They want to know if you're worried about a solicitor that came by, knocking on your door, and you had a funny feeling about them. There's nothing wrong with having the sheriff come by and check your house, whether you're home or not. That's why they're here, to help. The Lomita Sheriff Station wants to know when you're out of town, because they know that the burglars want to know. Help your local sheriff station be one step ahead of the burglars. Let the police know first when you're not home, and they'll keep an eye on the place for you. It doesn't hurt, and it's free. Take out your phone right now. You're probably on it right now Googling something or reading someone's post about their kid watching a silly cat video. So take less than a minute and pop this number on your phone. 310-539-1661. It's your local sheriff station and they don't mind swinging by. If you have a funny feeling about something, call them. They want to hear from you and they want to keep you safe. Here you go, last chance. 310-539-1661. 310-539-1661. Local charity Freedom For You held a jazz night at Trump National Golf Club. The event brings out students and parents who enjoy a night of jazz music while raising money for the charity. Here's more from Dr. Greg Allen. I love you just the way you look. Freedom for You is a youth nonprofit organization that's about 14 years old, and we try to help uh, teens find their passion and their purpose. And part of our, our mission is to help people find their talent and express it, whether it's in creative arts or you know leadership or service. And so tonight's about music and specifically jazz. And so there's a lot of talented kids, and we want to give them the opportunity to play in a nice setting and a nice environment and. And did you find jazz for them, or did they find it for you and bring it to you and say, hey, we should play some Well, you know, actually through different students being in our programs over the years, they pulled me into jazz and having jazz kind of environment. Most of the things we do, the students come up with the ideas, the teens do, and then we kind of help develop it and shape it and, and organize it. You know, a lot of the kids, they're so talented, and I, I talk to them, like, are you going to be a music major? They go, oh, no, no, no. There's a real connection between music and math. And a lot of the great musicians are, now they've gone on to college, they're engineers, or they're doing biomedical or something. So a lot of kids will continue in music, but it's a secondary thing. Maybe it's not their primary thing. Some, some kids will do it as a primary. You know, it's something that everybody always complains about the younger generation has no guidance. Well, here's the perfect opportunity to give them the guidance that they need. The kids are just as good as the professional, in my opinion. This is my second time coming to this jazz night, and I've tried to promote it. 
uh, just because I think these kids are phenomenal. It's, it's worth uh, every, you know, every time and effort and penny just to get out here and watch them and see their talent. You know, honestly, it's pretty cool to see um, uh, the different level of music as they age, whether it's junior high and high school, or even just later advanced jazz band, which is what's kind of going on here, right? Um, it's really fun to see them pick up and be more skilled at this type of music. Yeah. And developmentally, just from freshman to senior year, so much changes how you learn things and what goes on. So it, it's really cool to see how much better they are compared to when they're freshmen to when they're juniors or seniors. Well, I've been interested in jazz pretty much since... I was like a little boy, um, probably since about four or five. I started playing piano when I was like about five, and then my voice teacher was like, hey, you're always like singing and stuff, like you want to take voice lessons, and I was like, sure, why not? And so she started like teaching me jazz, because she's actually a jazz vocalist herself. Um, and from then on, it was just like, I loved it. Uh, Greg Allen somehow like contacted me and asked if I wanted to sing at one of the events. I think it was here first, and um, I was like, yeah, um, why not? And um, I guess they liked me um, because they would have like, for probably like five, six years, they had an event at Terranea just down there, um, and every year they'd have me come and sing there. You know, you'd have to go like to a nightclub maybe in, in LA or Hollywood to hear like jazz performers. Like right now we have Jessie Poulter performing. She's written music for TV shows, she's been gotten jazz awards, singing around the country. So she's performing in between the high school jazz bands. So it's really like a club kind of entertainment environment. It's really nice. She looks with her head not at me Tall, tan, young, lovely girl from me And he muddles walk into the And when she passes her smile And in sports, the Peninsula High football team has taken on a new challenge in the offseason, giving back to those less fortunate. The new Gridiron Club is raising money to help the local charity, Family Promise. The charity focuses on helping homeless families get back on their feet. Here is more on this collaborative effort. It's a constant message with us is all, always give back. Always give back to those that have given to you. And don't just look at yourself. Look at others and what we can do for others. More than anything, we're looking now to give back in a bigger sense when it comes to homelessness, when it comes to providing food, meals, clothing, and support. And that's where we're trying to take our program to a next level is of being people of better character and people who will help the community and the world. So we've formed the Gridiron Club here, and we're really looking at, for it to be an outreach group, some type of group that will benefit incoming freshmen, people within the community, um, from giving back to also helping with studies, um, anti-bullying campaigns, fairness and equality among campus. We kind of just would like to be another group of people on campus, like any other club, but one that can outreach a little bit more since we've got the numbers and we feel like power in numbers is one of our best strategies as football, so we feel like that's the best way for us to give back. Yeah, South Bay uh, Promise is a group that brings in families and they rotate them through their churches, give them a place to live. They really try to set them up for future endeavors, job training, skill training, the most important part to me is they allow the kids to stay in school. Um, kids don't need to be pulled out of school because of the homelessness. They are still allowed to stay within their school while parents are getting job training. And then the whole goal is not to keep them in those churches, is to get them out into their own homes eventually, working on their own in the workforce, and then all the while their children staying in school, which is the most important thing. Peninsula High recently uh, decided that they would, the football team would, would help you out. Tell us about what they did and how they hooked up with you. Um, they wanted to do a fundraiser that was specifically for Family Promise, and, and I know their coaches of the, I believe the freshman team, decided that they want to um, uh, build a, a forum that their, that their um, students can, can give back to the community. And so they just did a fundraiser for us, and we got to know them through a gentleman named Larry Campbell, who's one of their coaches. Yeah. You know, in, in football especially, and really in all sports, giving back is so very important. What do you think that, that young men learn from helping others out that are less fortunate? I think it's just a matter of looking outside yourself and realizing that all around you there's need. And if that's ingrained in you at a young age and you're exposed to that and you have access to being able to help, I think that's invaluable. And it's just from a life lesson standpoint and also just from uh, giving back to people around you that just need some help. And I think that's just, again, invaluable and super important. 
Family Promise is a national organization um, with over 200 chapters all over the United States. We serve newly homeless families with minor age children. We provide an array of services for them um, from case management to financial planning, life skills, and we help families that have been homeless a year or less get back into work and back into housing that's sustainable and um, stable. When a family comes to you, tell us how it works, how long they stay, and how they sort of get back on their feet. So we work with a lot of different community um, organizations. We partner with schools. We partner with uh, other organizations that actually provide homeless services, uh, Department of Mental Health, Department of Children and Family Services, Little Company of Mary, all the different school districts they, so families can come to us through those venues, through those uh, to those channels. So for us, we provide, again, um, services for families that um, are just need a hand up and need to be able to have a supportive environment um, and, and to get back on their feet because it's often very difficult if you're bouncing around from home to home, friend to friend, motel to motel, or leaving, living in your car. And so we want to make sure that families are safe, that they're provided for, they're cared for, and that's, that's what we do. I'm just really proud of our uh, football team, our coaches and our players because they know it's more than just what happens on the field. It's about giving back to others and being role models and making a difference in this world. And then people that want to donate, tell us how they can do that. Um, they can call the office, 310-782-8196. They can get on uh, our website, uh, familypromiseosb.org. Um, our main uh, website, our main email address is info at familypromiseosb.org. And, and they can just um, look to see what we do. I want people to find out what we do. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to give just because we're a great organization. I want them to give because they believe in, in what we're doing. Because I think how, how we approach service, how we approach um, really tackling this, this problem is, is very unique. And, and I think that we have the capacity and the building the desire to, to make some, and affect some change here in the South Bay. And so we've been given that gift to be here. And I think that we have a responsibility to do so. Palos Verdes author Gianna Culbertson is making her mark in the literary world. You might say she's even living a fairy tale as Cinderella's daughter. Here is more on the story. I've always been a bit of a writer. When I was little, I wrote lots of stories and I did the illustrations and that was my thing. You know, some kids discover they love animals and some kids, you know, they can't get a bunch of Legos. Maybe they'll grow up to be an architect. I always wrote when I was little. Uh, I wrote my first story when I was in the first grade uh, in Mayor Catalina at Miss Mooney's elementary, Miss Mooney's uh, first grade class and since then I didn't stop but then you know you grow and you that's replaced with book reports and essays and your writing takes a turn but then when I was in college I um, you know got back into it and one day I just had this idea and people always ask me where the inspiration for the story came from and I really do wish I had something more concrete than pure you know the lightning strikes the brain luck but I really was just sitting in class one day when the name of the school in my book which is Lady Agnew School for Princesses and Other Female Protagonists came into my head and I was like that's that's interesting Maybe I can build on that. And before I knew it, I had the prologue to the first book. And then around that time, I also, um, in school, took this great fairy tales class. I went to USC. And so that just, we dove into all this research from fairy tales past. And the idea for the series started to grow. And I realized I hadn't written for myself in a very long time. And even if I had, you know, homework and, you know, classes and clubs and everything like that, I set myself out to continue this project. And my roommate probably thought I was nuts because I was probably the only college kid that purposefully got up at like 4 a.m. every Friday to write before classes start, but it was my promise to myself to do it every week without stop, and little by little, planes, trains, and automobiles, classrooms, patios, etc., I got the books done. And so uh, when I graduated a few months after, I had finally finished uh, the first three books, and that's when I set off to look for publishers. So the main concept behind the book series is about the children and younger siblings of former fairy tale characters, and they live in a world actually called book, where they train to be the next generation of main characters in stories. Um, Chrysanthemum Knight, or Chrissa, as she goes by, um, you know, she's born into this world where, like all of us, you know, we have expectations from our parents and those people that came before us. She is the daughter of one of the most famous princesses of all time. 
time and people expect her to grow up and fill an archetype, a role. And so she knows her whole life that there's this fate expected for her that the author is actually going to write. And she doesn't believe in that. She wants to set her own path um, because she knows that Although you know the past is important and we are we should take lessons from where we came from, she shouldn't just be limited. But what came before her, she's something new. Uh, but I just I wanted a, a girl character that I could look up to. And you know, growing up, you are encouraged uh, if you're a girl to like love the Disney princesses. Like that's your jam, the Disney princesses. Um, love them, they're awesome. But they're I started to love more, um, I want to say, superhero comic books and characters like that as I grew, but they didn't merge enough, and I wanted something to combine both worlds, the hero and the princess, into something that I could not only relate to in terms of, I can see myself pieces of that in that character, but something I could look up to also. Um, as a, you know, a young girl, you know, you should, it's great to look up to Iron Man and Percy Jackson and Spider Man, but where are my ladies at? Where are the where are the girls I that kick butt? And it's getting better. I feel like um, every year more you know more women and girls are portrayed stronger and more powerful. Um, but so that is another core reason why I'm very passionate about my characters and the series development because creating that relatable girl who you know starts out like normal has her doubts or insecurities like all of us but then over the course of time would grow into something admirable and powerful I like to say something that's both valiant and vulnerable and that will do it for us from everyone here at RPV TV make it a great day